With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, here's the Emmanuel Pulpit and Pastor Mike Stone. Now we live in an American culture that values strength. Our talent contests try to find the best singers. Our beauty pageants look for the prettiest and the shapeliest women. Our athletic events crown those who can hit the ball the farthest, throw the ball the hardest, lift the most weight, or score the most points. While there's nothing wrong with these kinds of athletic success, the problem occurs when we bring that sense of superiority and personal innate giftedness into the Lord's work. In contrast to that mindset, the story of Gideon's remarkable defeat of the Midianite army is, among other things, the story of the power of God on display. And far from portraying Gideon as a strong, mighty warrior or a brilliant military strategist, this text is really about the power of Gideon's God. If medals are to be awarded, they belong to God. If trophies are to be distributed, they should be placed at the feet of the Lord God. For here in Judges chapter 7, we find but the latest example in this Old Testament history book about a powerful God who delivers a weak people. And he delivers them here the way he has delivered their fathers in the past, and it's the same way that he delivers us. He uses an unexpected deliverer with unexpected means. In so doing, God puts his marvelous and merciful work on display against the backdrop of our utter and total weakness. The story of Judges 7 is a story about the glory of of weakness. I come not with an apology, but I do come with an explanation. Your flesh will not like tonight's message because the message of Judges 7 is that you're not too weak, you're too strong. You don't have too little going for you. You've got too much going for you. And the weakest among God's people tonight still most likely needs to have the Holy Ghost of God pull the props out from under you, lay you flat on your back, give you nothing but an utter awareness of your total need of God to cry out with the old hymn writer, I need thee, oh, I need thee every hour, I need thee. And when you come to the end of yourself, you find you've got nothing going for you except the power of Almighty God. That's when you realize there is indeed glory in being weakened in the presence of Almighty God. Judges 7 is about the glory of weakness. Now, I'm not going to reread the entire text. It was a lengthy text when we read it the first time. But I want to show you three principles about the glory of weakness. When you and I face adversity, challenges, and troubles in our life, the very first thing that must happen, our help must be reduced. Our help must be reduced. In chapter 6, God called, commanded, and commissioned Gideon to deliver the Israelite people from the Midianites. Seven years of bondage was enough in the sight of God. Freedom was coming, and General Gideon would be the one to lead God's army of freedom fighters. And in our last lessons, the call went out to every corner of the kingdom. Some were nearby enough that they heard Gideon's trumpet blast. Others responded perhaps to the handwritten note of a courier, and they've all assembled near the valley of Jezreel. 32,000 of them have come. The problem is just across the way, the Midianite army and the armies of their allies from all across the east have also assembled. And though chapter 7 does not tell us, the count that is given in chapter 8 of the casualties and the survivors together tell us that Gideon's 32,000 will be facing an army of 135 thousand men. And the enemy army are battle-hardened commandos with camels that are as numerous as the sands of the sea. By contrast, while Gideon may take some pleasure in the 32,000 Israelites that have gathered together, when you look at the number and the nature of Gideon's army, you can better understand why Gideon in that moment put out a fleece in the presence of God. The number and the nature of his army were not very encouraging. 
The number itself, 32,000, that sounds wonderful until you realize you're going up against 135,000. That, that's, that's a little worse off than, than one against four. And gazing into the enemy camp, their camels, which today we would say their, their, their tanks and their bombs and their weapons were, were hyperbolically described as outnumbering the sands of the ocean and the opposing army filled the lower valley like a swarm of locusts. There wasn't a lot of confidence in the number of his army, nor a lot of confidence in the nature of his army. A ragtag group of minute men. They hadn't so much as swung a sword in these seven years of bondage, much less routed any opposing army. They were farmers and vineyard keepers for seven years and didn't even have enough strength in the last seven years or the guts to defend their own property. I mean, none of the men in Gideon's army were flying a don't tread on me flag out in their front yard. They were content to fly a peace flag from the United Nations and maybe had a coexist bumper sticker on their mule drone wagon. On the other side, there were battle tried, battle hardened warriors with scars on their faces, nicks in their swords, and Israeli blood caked up under their fingernails. Four to one was bad enough, but when you look at the roster, they had four Rambos and we've got Barney Fife. They had a virtual sea of bloodthirsty warriors and our side has just deputized Goober, Floyd, and Otis. So I can certainly understand Gideon praying for God to do something about those odds. Now, the text doesn't reveal this particular prayer, but in my glorified imagination, I can't help but think that Gideon might have said, God, is this really what you want me to do? I've had one sign back in the wine press. There was another sign when the angel of the Lord touched the, the, the meal that was upon the rock. There was the dry fleece. There was the wet fleece. There were all of these signs, but God, the odds don't look really good. It's, it's one against four, and God says, you're right. The odds are not what I want them to be. You have too many. If you think the odds are bad now, by the literally, mathematically, by the time God gets finished reducing Gideon's help, it's a hundred times worse at the end than it is at the beginning. Now, as God reduces Gideon's help, and as I mentioned, pulls the props out from under him as he often needs to do for this preacher and probably this congregation. There are two things I want to bring to your attention. One, I've intentionally labeled it the weakness of his might. Gideon had some strength. 32,000, one against four is not terribly bad. The four to one advantage held by Midian was a big deal, but the problem was the big deal was still too small. For you see, military historians have recorded numerous battles through human history where the ratio was very similar, perhaps even more lopsided, and yet the smaller, weaker, lesser army prevailed. For example, in the year 1700, the Swedish army defeated the Russian army, even though they were also outnumbered four to one. The Poles defeated the Russians in 1610, despite a deficit that was five to one. And the British army defeated the army of the nation of India in 1757, despite being outnumbered 15 to one. Many of you remember the name of Audie Murphy. It was on January the 26th, 1945, this 19-year-old American soldier single-handedly held off an attack from part of a German battalion. He had 20 confirmed kills from the German army and for killing one against 20, he became the most decorated American soldier in all of World War II. But this pales in comparison to the lopsided forces that Gideon is going to need to fight this mighty victory because the victory was so profound by the time God got through weakening his might and showing the mighty hand of God, the victory was so lopsided that God recorded the military report in his precious inspired book. And hundreds of years later, we are now studying this military record on a Sunday night. 
Gideon starts off being down four to one. That, that's not exactly comfortable, but we have to admit, just looking at world military history, four to one is not comfortable, but it's still possible. And God's power is not perfected in the realm of human possibility. I believe I'll say that again. God's power, His strength, His might is not perfected in the realm of human possibility. Do you remember an old song the Gaither Vocal Band recorded? And I'm not trying to just put down music all the time, but I'm telling you their their song says that, that God and I make a majority. The only problem is God's a majority with or without you. His strength is not perfected when we have possibility. His strength is perfected in our weakness. And if you think that you can do something without him, he's just providential enough, just sovereign enough, just loving enough to let you try. And you'll find out he told the truth. When robed in flesh, God said that apart from me, you can do nothing. Mylon Lefebvre, the old hymn writer, said that without him, I could do nothing. And without him, I'd surely fail. And most of God's people would testify there have been times we've tried it without him and we have indeed surely failed. Now, why did God see his might as a weakness? Well, the answer is actually found in verse 2. God, God knew his people. He said, if I let you go and fight this battle, basically one of you against four of them, if you happen to win... Y'all going to be high-fiving, pinning medals on yourself, erecting statues to one another and singing out the Israeli fight song, we will, we will rock you. I know you. You're going to say, look what we did. We delivered ourselves by our hand and our strength and our might. And the Bible teaches us very clearly that God will not, absolutely will not share His glory. Through the prophet Isaiah in chapter 42 and verse 8, God said, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another. The fact is most of us try to come into some type of pact with God where we can share in the glory and divvy up the proceeds and we can say God did his part, but I did my part. God couldn't have done it without me even though I know I couldn't have done it without God. God says if you've got that attitude about your own personal ability, what you think is a strength is a weakness. Sometimes we pray for God to give people strength in the midst of their problems. Someone's going through a terrible sickness. God, would you give them and their family members strength? Maybe someone is facing a job loss or some financial calamity. God, would you give them strength to face all the challenges of their tomorrows? Now hear me clearly. That's not a bad prayer to pray. That God would be their strength, that God would be their shield, that God would be their provision. But sometimes, and I don't know exactly when these would be, but I'm convinced that sometimes, rather than praying God give them strength, we would do better by them to pray God give them weakness. Weakness enough to realize they cannot face their challenges except that you empower them with an unseen hand from another world that gives them the actual strength that they need. God saw Gideon's might as a weakness. Now in my observation, I've never seen anybody too small for God to use, but I've known some who are too big for God to use. I've never known anybody too ignorant for God to use. I I grew up partially under the ministry of a preacher who couldn't even read, had a third grade education. His wife would read him his preaching text for that Sunday, and as she would read it, he would memorize it. I've never known anybody too academically ignorant for God to use, but I've known some who are too intellectual and high-minded to be used by God. I've never known anybody too weak to be used, but I've known plenty who are too strong to be used. And it may be that what you're facing tonight or in the tomorrows of your life Rather than lifting you up, God may first need to take you down a notch or two because you've got too much talent, too much ability, too much giftedness, too much skill. Maybe you've got too much money. Maybe God raised up Putin to invade the Ukraine to send bread prices and gas prices soaring through the roof because we've got so much at our disposal that we don't have to depend on the power of Almighty God. 
Gideon's help had to be reduced. There was the weakness of his might. Also, we read in the text about the winnowing of his men. Gideon needed what I have often needed. He needed God to take some things away from him. Now, if being down four to one made his knees shake and caused him to throw a wool blanket out in front of his tent to wait on the morning dew, just wait until you and Gideon see what God does next. There's a little twofold winnowing away, a reduction of the military force. First of all, God dismisses all the frightened soldiers. Can you imagine when God said to Gideon, you've got too many, I want you to tell all the fraidy cats to go home. Gideon probably said, well, that'd be all right. Don't need any of the weak-kneed, lily-livered sissies anyway. All right, all y'all afraid, 32,000, all y'all that are too afraid and trembling. The Bible says you're fearful and trembling. So you're afraid enough that in the presence of other grown men, and that's something men don't easily do, you're sitting there shaking in your Levi's. All of you that are fearful and trembling, you may go home. And to his surprise, 22,000 walk away. I don't think he was expecting that when he said, all right, all you wusses with lace on your ephod, go ahead and pack up and head back to mama's house. 22,000 of them take off their fatigues and put their skinny jeans back on, grab their pocketbooks, put their hair back up in a man bun, tuck tail and run back to mama's house. I've got to ask myself, why did they show up down with the army anyway? 32,000 showed up, 22,000 didn't even want to be there and weren't willing to fight. I, I think they may be the, the, the ancestors of a lot of Southern Baptists and other so-called conservative evangelicals. What they heard was something's going to be done about the Midianites. And they say, oh, if there's going to be a fight, I want to show up and get me a, a place on the front row. But they just didn't want a place on the front line. If there's some work going to be done, I want to show up and watch it. Oh, you want me to take a sword? I'm going to get my backpack and head home. Everybody says amen about winning the lost until you hand them a gospel track and a prospect card. Everybody believes in Bible study until you tell them their Sunday school class meets in room 102. Brother Matt, everybody believes in raising children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord until you say we need some Awana workers on Wednesday night. Everybody's in favor of reaching teenagers for Christ until you need some workers in the student ministry. Everybody believes that we need a place of service until you give them a sign-up card and expect them and ask them to work. So 22,000, better than two-thirds of his military force, has tucked tail and headed back to the house. So the winnowing of his men, first he dismisses those who are frightened soldiers, and then there's this strange test of How do you drink water? He's going to take them down to the water supply. And some are going to put their head face down and lap, I mean tongue to the water, just like a dog would drink. And then some will kneel down and most likely they would cup their hand and bring the water up to their mouth. Now growing up in church and hearing this story told, uh, I've heard all kind of explanations for this test. Most of the explanations say that God was trying to find the soldiers that, that, that didn't expose their neck to the enemy, that, that they were cautious and they were watchful. I, I'm not getting into all of that tonight, but I will tell you, I don't personally think that's the case because God, God knew He didn't actually need them to fight anyway. He needed them to play the trumpet in the band and bust some teapots and do some shouting. Whatever the rationale or the reason was, it was ultimately just God's way of taking the now reduced army of 10,000 down to a mere 300. Gideon, you didn't like one against four. It's now one against 450. But in this case, that's perfectly fine. God didn't need all those other men anyway. In fact, God never intended to use them in the battle alone. In fact, God only called them down to the front lines to use them as an object lesson in Gideon's life. 1 Samuel 14, 6, there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. In other words, it doesn't matter how many are in the army. God can save with a few just as easily as God can save by many. By the way, this is not the focus of this 
passage, but, and I don't want to presume on the will of God, but I will say this. I sure would hate to think that I would be numbered among those outside of the 300 that the only way that I'd been of service to God was that He used me as an illustration of what He was able to do without me. Sometimes when we're facing difficulty, our help must be reduced. Secondly, our hesitancy must be reinforced. If Gideon had been nervous before, he's shaking in his sandals now. I can almost imagine him looking around for that wool rug again. Okay, Lord, this, this time I want half of it to be wet and half of it to be dry. But God in His mercy calms Gideon's nerves and removes Gideon's fears with a couple of glorious reminders. First, what I've labeled the declaration of the master. If you look in verse 9, and now the same night it came about that the Lord said to him, Arise, go down to the camp. Look at this language, for I have given it into your hands. God puts his promise in the past tense. It's settled and done. The same God who spoke and light started shining before there was a sun, a moon, or stars now says, I've already made up my mind, I've already given them over into your hand. The same God that spoke and cattle were formed and fish began to swim and birds began to fly. The same God that said to the leper, be cleansed, said to the blind, to see and the deaf to hear, says to Brother Gideon, I have already determined, I have already given them into your hand. And you better write this down on your heart. When the I am says I have, it is. It's already been done. He's asking Gideon to respond and act in faith based on the promise of his word. And that's what faith does. Faith acts as if it's already so even before it is so because it knows that when God says that it's so, it's as good as so even though it doesn't look like it's so. Even before it becomes so, it's already as good as so. Did you follow any of that? In fact, faith believes that the declaration of God is so powerful that things that don't seem to be so But God has said or so are actually more so than the things that seem to be so that God has said are not so. Could you repeat that, preacher? Not if my life depended on it. But the Bible says that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Gideon has an opportunity to take God at his word and move forward in faith merely based on the declaration of the master. Now, to be clear, I'm not talking about health, wealth, and prosperity I'm not talking about the power of positive confession where you claim the redemption of your children and you claim the restoration of your marriage and you claim the removal of cancer and you claim this and you claim that. You see, that heretical teaching always focuses on something that you say. But I'm not talking about something that you say as a positive confession. That, I'm not talking about you naming something and you claiming something. I'm talking about you having enough faith to know what God has said and to stand on what God has said. As we sang earlier in this service, I'm standing on the promises that cannot fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail by the, by the living Word of God, I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God. God has given him a word and is gracious enough to remind him. If you go back to to chapter 6, this is at least the sixth, some would say the seventh time that God says, I'm going to use you to defeat the army of the Midianites. God, God just reassures him with the declaration of the master. And isn't he faithful to do that in our lives? Through a Christian friend, a sermon on a podcast or maybe a CD or the radio, a gospel song, a Sunday school lesson, an Awana lesson that God just so faithfully and lovingly reminds us of who He is and what He has promised. I can't give you a lot of detail. I don't have time or liberty to do so, but I, I would testify tonight. About two weeks ago, I found myself in one of the most painful and challenging situations I have ever faced. I have never in my whole life felt more helpless and hopeless. And let me just encourage you, don't sit there and try to figure out what it is because you'll get it wrong and you'll miss what God's wanting to say to you about your situation. But in the midst of that, and I didn't know what to do, I didn't know where to turn, I had some commitments that I was supposed to be out of town. I didn't know if I was supposed to go out of town. My wife 
gave her blessing for me to go ahead and go on this trip. And I got in my truck and I wasn't even, I wasn't even down the road at my house when my phone had connected. You know how your phone, when you get in your car, it connects. If you've got Bluetooth capability in your car. And here I am at what I think is the end of my rope. And a song started playing on my Bluetooth radio off my phone. I hadn't heard this song. I didn't remember hearing this song since I was in high school. I later checked it out. It was written in 1986. And I guess that's when I heard the song for maybe the first or the last time. But it's been remade. And I'm riding down the road. I mean, not knowing which way to turn spiritually. And I started hearing the singers on the radio say, Three Hebrew boys were thrown into the fire Because before the king they would not bow They said, well, listen, king, let it be known We serve a living God, we're not alone Well, I know my God can do it To him there's nothing to it I know he'll see me through with sweet victory Well, even when storms are raging He is the rock of ages And I know that he is able Mighty is he They marched around the walls of Jericho They knew that they would fall God told them so And just like he worked for them He's working now My God will never fail He has great power For I know my God can do it to him There's nothing to it I know he'll see you through With sweet victory Well even when storms are raging He is the blessed rock of ages I know that he is able Mighty is he you say, does God speak like that? Absolutely he does. Now, as good as that was, faith doesn't come by a gospel song on the radio, but I also happen to be working on a sermon I preached last Sunday that said, now to him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Let the church say amen. God gave the declaration of the master to reinforce Gideon's hesitant faith. There's the declaration of the master. And there's also the dream of the Midianite. This is a kind of a strange part of the story most people don't pay attention to. God gave Gideon a reminder of his promise. And then said, if that's not enough or if you're still afraid, let me tell you what you can do. Slip down to the Midianite camp tonight. And I'm telling you in advance, you're going to overhear them talking about something. And when you hear what they're talking about, that's going to give you the fortification of your faith. And so, he said, if you're afraid to go alone, take your boy with you. And so he goes down there with a servant boy. And I guess they're in some kind of disguise. Or maybe they didn't know exactly what Gideon looked like. But he, he just happens upon this conversation. And one guy's telling his buddy, he said, man, I had the strangest dream last night. I don't know if it was pepperoni pizza, if I stayed up too late this weekend, binging on Netflix. I don't know exactly what it was, but it was just the, it was just the strangest dream. He says, do tell. He said, well, well we're, just, we're just, you know, wandering around in the camp, and all of a sudden, a big barley loaf, a loaf of bread, if you will, came rolling down the mountainside and ran into one of our tents and knocked it over. Now, I don't have any idea why that's supposed to represent Gideon. No idea. But I'll tell you this. The guy he was telling the dream to, I believe by divine revelation, shoving Bible truth through the mouth of a pagan, he said to his friend, I'll tell you what that dream's about. That's Gideon. That's the son of Joash. God has given us into his hand. You see, God had promised Gideon the victory, but Gideon was still afraid. And that's clearly implied in the text. God's word should have been sufficient, but God knew in that moment that for Gideon's fears, it was not. And so God let him hear it from somebody that was alive and in the flesh. It's sort of like the little boy who was afraid of the dark, and he kept getting up and asking his daddy, would you come sleep with me until I can fall asleep? And The daddy kept telling him, go back to bed, God is with you, go back to bed, God is with you, go back to bed, God is with you. And finally, the little boy said, I know God is in here, but I want somebody with skin on. (laughs) Sometimes we need to hear a good word from somebody with skin on. 
That's why you need to be a part of a small group Bible study we call Sunday school. That's why you need to be connected with a local body of believers. And if you're a visitor tonight and you regularly attend Emmanuel, we, we, we want you to come and partner together with us because we need people in our lives that will speak the Word of God and confirm it in our lives. So they slip down to the Midianite camp and they overhear the enemy. By the way, God in human history and redemptive history has often been pleased to confirm his work and his word even through ungodly people. Pilate said, I find no fault in him. He's an innocent man. Judas said, I've betrayed innocent blood. Pilate's wife said, don't have anything to do with this just man. The centurion said, surely this was a righteous man. In Luke's gospel, Jesus was in the synagogue at Capernaum and a, and a demon-possessed man came forward and the demons from inside the man said, what have we to do with you, Jesus? We know who you are. You are the Holy Son of God. Gideon, my victory is so sure, says the Lord, that the blind can see it, the deaf can hear it, the mute can tell about it, and a spiritually dead man can even be used to proclaim what I'm about to do. His hesitancy, and sometimes our hesitancy, must be reinforced. Our help must be reduced. Thirdly and finally, when we're facing difficulty, our hero must be recognized. Our hero must be rightly recognized and identified. The subtitle of our series, Finding Jesus in Judges. And I'll try to be careful to not allegorize the text or see the Lord Jesus in places He doesn't show up. But what I mean by finding Jesus in Judges is that Jesus told the disciples on the road to Emmaus that all of the Old Testament was a testimony of Him. So as we read through this text and study this book, we ought to look for the living Lord Jesus Christ. And I find Him on this Midianite battlefield in two simple ways. First, I see Him in the unusual strategy. Gideon's knees have been buckling. But now they bow and they bend. For upon overhearing the translation and interpretation of this dream, the Bible says that Gideon bowed down and worshipped. But just as soon as he gets back to his own camp of 300, he unfolds the plan. All right, guys, gather around. Here's the plan. You know those 22,000 that left and then most of the remaining 10,000 that left? They left all their provision and their trumpets. I think we've got 300 trumpets that we can pass around. Everybody grab a trumpet. What are you, starting a band? Grab a trumpet. Grab a torch. Grab a teapot. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go first, and you follow me. We're going to play Gideon says, we're going to play follow the leader. You follow me, and when I blow the trumpet, you blow your trumpet. When I smash my teapot, you smash your teapot. And when I give my shout, you give your shout. Can you imagine these 300 men saying, really? You're kidding, right? But let's be honest. If military strategists had commented on this battle plan going down through verse 20, they would have said that will never work. You're not going to beat the Midianite army like that. There's no way that people can be delivered by such an humble man using a method that is so weak, so simple, so foolish. Only an utter fool would believe that. And it is in this way that we see a blood-soaked glimpse of a weak and dying Savior who uses a very strange and unexpected, unusual method to deliver us from our sin. I think we should stop tonight and be honest. It's, we have to admit that our Lord hanging there in suffering agony on the tree looks less like a king than he had at any point in his life. How could it be that this dying, bleeding, suffering carpenter from Galilee could be God's plan to redeem the world? And even after we watch him rise from the dead, we've got to be honest and say sometimes we want to say, why did God do it like that? Paul gives the answer in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 
And said, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise and the weak things of the world to shame the things that are strong and the insignificant things of the world and the despised things of the world God has chosen. And he uses the things that are not. And here's why. So that he may nullify the things that are so that no flesh may boast before God. So that when we bow in repentance and submission to the Lord Jesus... We know that that's something that only God could have done. When military strategists would look at Calvary's cross as the battle for our soul, none of them would have ever thought that it would work. In fact, they would probably look, and many to this day still look at it and say, that is foolish. But I submit to you tonight, the preaching of the cross may indeed be foolishness to them that are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the very power of God. The unusual strategy Finally, I want to say a word about the unmistakable Savior. For if you walk away from this text throwing wreaths and lauding praise upon Gideon, you've misidentified the real hero of this narrative. In fact, just by word count, Gideon's name is mentioned 14 times in this chapter. The Lord's name is used either by proper name or by obvious pronoun 16 times. Now, God doesn't need to beat out Gideon by a Bible word count in order to earn and deserve the glory, but it's a fact. The only warrior that deserved to be awarded from this battle is not General Gideon, but General Jehovah, the captain of the hosts of heaven, the commander-in-chief of the army of God, the general of all the generals, the leader of all the leaders, the Lord of all the lords, and the king of all the kings. In fact, if you look in verse 22, here's the heat of the battle, verse 22. When they blew the 300 trumpets... It was the Lord that set the sword of one man against another. Don't misidentify the hero of this text. One great gospel songwriter described him and said, He is higher than the highest and greater than the great, and no one will ever take his crown away. And herein, church, in conclusion, is the real glory of weakness. It's hard to preach on this topic Virtually impossible to preach under this title without thinking about the Apostle Paul's thorn in the flesh. You remember the occasion where Paul had a thorn in the flesh. It's, it's, it's not known exactly what it is. It's a, it's a mystery known only to Paul and to God at this point. But what I do know is this. He prayed and asked the Lord to remove it from him three times. And God ultimately told him no. But May I remind you of why God gave him the thorn in the flesh? Two times you'll find it in the book of 2 Corinthians. Two two different times. Paul said, I was given a thorn in the flesh to keep me from exalting myself. Paul had a lot going for him. Paul was gifted. Paul was well able. Paul was anointed. Paul had been taken either by vision or by revelation, by translation. He had been taken into the very third heaven, what we would commonly call heaven. And because of what he describes as as the surpassing greatness of these revelations, lest I get full of myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh. I was so strong God had to give me weakness. And after praying for God to remove it the third time, the Lord Jesus in His ascended glory responded in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And He, that is Jesus, said unto me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul then responds, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my weaknesses, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Here's the glory of weakness, that Lord, if you have to take me down to nothing for your power to be on full ultimate display in my life, then I will glory in the fact that you have stripped me naked and bare. I will bless your name that you have placed me in this prison 
I will glorify you and I will exalt you for every burden, every weight, every ounce of trouble that you have put on my life. So tonight I close with this simple thought. Whatever you're facing, rather than praying for strength, you may start praying for weakness. And if you feel that you can barely go on, ask God to take that barely away, to strip you down to absolutely nothing except a God-given awareness of the glory of weakness. You've been listening to the Emmanuel Pulpit, the broadcast ministry of Pastor Mike Stone, Senior Pastor of Emmanuel Baptist Church in Blackshear, Georgia. With confidence in the authority and sufficiency of the Word of God, Pastor Mike is committed to walking you verse by verse through books of the Bible. We pray this message has been an encouragement to you as you seek to learn and live the Word of God. Free audio downloads of this message, as well as general contact information, are available through our website at ebchurch.net. Thanks for joining us for today's message from the Emmanuel Pulpit.